welcome. So excited to be here at Houston House. I'm joined here, Sean, come on up, uh, with Sean Kelly of Amperon. We'll take a minute just to do quick intros and then jump into the really fun stuff of team and talent and innovation and honestly, I think what is probably one of the most critical topics as you're building a company. Uh, at Hello Alice, we are a tech platform that supports nearly 1.5 million small business owners across the country. Uh, we focus primarily on early stage micro businesses, um, typically in their kind of first five years of growth, and help connect those founders to sources of capital, to solutions that they need to help grow, all based on their personal and business profile. So, uh, tech is an incredibly important piece of, of what we do to scale those resources across that community, um, but we're also a very mission driven organization. So, our, our culture is really critical. Um, I think the mission that we set out to do in those early years has never wavered for a moment. Our goal, goal was all, always to build uh, equitable access to, to capital networks and opportunities. Um, that has never changed. I will say just about everything else from our company since we launched in 2017 has changed, um, but our mission has not. And so I think our topic today is gonna be very, very important and really interesting. I'm excited to dig in, Sean, with you. But I'll turn it over to you to, to intro Amperon and, and what you guys are up to. Awesome, thanks so much. Uh, yeah, so Sean Kelly, co-founder and CEO of Amperon. Uh, we were founded in 2018, uh, so just had our six year anniversary. Um, we were actually founded in New York, uh, despite the fact that I grew up in Sugar Land, Texas, and then we promptly moved it back to Houston uh, for a variety of reasons, um, which we'll get into uh, here in a minute. What we do uh, is we do uh, electricity demand forecasting, wind forecasting, solar forecasting, uh, scope uh, to carbon insights, and as well price forecasting across North America, Australia, and then we're launching Europe right now. Uh, so it's been a really fun ride. We've raised $30 million in capital uh, with a Series B that happened in October, uh, led by Energize Capital. Uh, and we finally got some good Houston money in there. Uh, Maynard Holt, Veriton, uh, joined the round, which we were really excited to see. Uh, really impressive firm that's done some really good deals in the energy sector. What I've done is B2B, uh, focused on, we've got about 100 clients, and uh, the team right now is at 90 employees. Uh, which on January 1st of 2023, we were at 28. So it's been a little bit of a wild road. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I've had a, had a really good 2024 so far, but excited to talk, I mean, exactly what you said. The only reason you can have a successful company is if you have a good culture that attracts talent and then obviously be innovative in what you're doing. Uh, if you don't focus on all three of those, it doesn't matter what space you're in there's no shot at having a successful company. So I thought, Sean, we could start sharing stories from the very earliest days, because I'm sure, well, certainly your team has grown a lot, our team has grown a lot, uh, and in the types of employees, particularly in those earliest days, I felt like one of the hardest things in, in growing Hello Alice was at the beginning, trying to attract talent. And I always say that the number one job of a CEO of a company is to have great sales skills because you're not only selling to clients, you're not only selling to investors, you're really selling to attract talent. Uh, and, and I remember in our case, our, our chief product officer, Kelsey Ruger, a, a great Houstonian, uh, told us no for two years before he finally took a job because it was high risk. He had a lot of opportunities, he had a lot of options, incredibly talented individual, but he told us no. It takes a lot of selling. Tell me about your team, how did you get the earliest talent at Amperon, what was that journey like for you? It was hard. Uh, I mean, if anything, so we've run kind of two separate companies. For the first four years, we ran the company on $2.75 million. The last two years, we've run it on 27 million raised. So it's really been a different story. And for us, I mean, the big thing was doing product market fit. And I mean, there was some uh, talk up here earlier about just going in, just listening to clients and doing all that. and so we just hired people who also knew clients or potential clients. And so I think our first big hire we hired, he was in Boston and with the ask that if he could move to Houston. And this was in 2019, uh, his name's Elliot. He's my head of product uh, still to this day. And so he wanted to move in. And when you're a CEO at that stage, well, you're definitely more of a co-founder than a CEO because it's hard to be a CEO over like seven people. Uh, and so, 
from that standpoint, you really have to like sell the dream. And the cool thing now is I can actually look back and there's so many people that I sold this vision to and we've actually exceeded that. And so that feels really good. Now the people I'm selling the vision to, now I'm like, well, geez, this is a high bar. I've gotta go exceed that again. And so just really having someone who knew what we were doing, understood what we were doing, realized the risk and just being completely open and transparent. I think that's the biggest thing that's helping us hire now is we are just straight to the point we let everyone know where we stand, where everything looks, what like what our performance metrics are, things like that. And so I think just honesty and transparency, people know that. People can tell if you're lying or not. Uh, and so I think that's the biggest thing to attract talent. We were very slow to hire at the beginning too. We were so picky of finding them and that's how we ended up a remote team. Our very first hire, guy came in uh, and he was, I mean, PhD, like former Microsoft research, did high frequency trading at DRW, happened to be in Israel. And we were like, okay, he's still there. He's been, he's about to have his six year anniversary with us. And so just being so deliberate and intentional in that and just finding the right fit. Because working at a company and working at a startup are totally different things, especially those early days. Uh, Elliot, my head of product jokes that I offered him three, I offered him three jobs and said, do you, can you code, do you wanna sell, or do you wanna run product? And he's like, great. I want to run product. I go, perfect. So you're in charge of product, customer success, and technical sales. And I was like, you picked one out of three, but I still gave you three jobs. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I think so much of those early hires, too, is, is about going with your gut as a founder. I think you, you are really the only person that knows the vision for the company, where you want to go, the types of people that you need, the type of culture that you want to build. I think back, we built our first version of Hello Alice over at Pivotal Labs in, in San Francisco. Um, which at the time was owned by Dell, and so through a partnership with Dell, we built out there. They had a whole process. They, as we were working there, to the to the right of me was the Department of Defense as a client. To the left of me was Ernst and Young, and then it was me. And I was literally the only employee at the company at the time when I walked into Pivotal. And so they helped hire because I was like, I have no idea what I need to hire. This is my first like real, full fledged tech company. Uh, and so I was like, we were looking for a, a head of engineering. And they had a whole matrix that they went through and this whole process. And in a miscommunication from the team that was helping to hire, I thought they said this person that we had interviewed was a go, like she's great. I loved her, I thought she was wonderful and very talented. They said, no, she's not a, I think, I think it was like we need, to, we need to move ahead or something was the terminology. And I took it as a yes, they meant to no. know. Um, so I ended up extending an offer Honestly, because I really thought this person was a great employee. She was phenomenal. She was so good. One of the most talented employees. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, what I learned from that experience, even though I probably would have listened to them at the time, was you have to go with your gut. Like the reality, yeah. you know better than any expert out there who you need to hire for your team and the type of company yep. that, that you want to build. I hired a ton from my network. And uh, I mean, I went to Texas A&M. As yes, you. great choice, Sean, so, great choice. We love our network. Uh, and so from that, just like I started at an early age, like freshman year of college networking. And so now having a 20 plus year network has been extremely helpful because again, it's people who have like gotten to know you over time. Like if they still like you at this point, then probably sticking around and have a shot at hiring them. But we, for the longest time, our whole commercial side of things were like one degree of separation from me. Uh, and again, personal relationships mean a ton because again, you've got to sell a dream. You're like, okay, we're almost out of money. There's six of us, but I promise this thing is going to crush it. So, if you were to, to define the culture at at Ambron, and I would say both both in terms of how you originally envisioned it and what it actually is, how do those two visions match up? So I found out from one of my execs that almost every single review that I did had said agency in it. Like the ability to just go figure it out just to get things done. And so of our values, some of them we have like be relentless, fill in the blanks, like really still a whole bunch of self-starters. I, if I have to sit there and lay out the entire thing or we need to have a meeting for the meeting, about the meeting, then it's just not gonna work. And so for us, I mean, we have a very, very just outwork everyone. A number of the things that we've done have literally been the path of most resistance. And, but that's the culture that we've built. However, we also do a very good job of trying not to run people into the ground. And so we have, I mean, 
the popular thing in startup land is the like unlimited time off, but we actually, back from my trading days, so I was an electricity trader for 11 years, they made you take a week or two off. It was to check your books and make sure there was nothing sketchy going on, but it was also a really good time to go in, take a deep breath, and then go and figure out like what's next. And so we make everyone take a mandatory like nine full days in a row off. Um, and then other than that, have a pretty flexible like work when you need to work. Most of our team has kids. Their schedules are whatever illness they got in daycare and then going around that. And so for us, everyone gets things done. And so you'll slack fires off also having people from the West Coast all the way to, we've got two people in Dubai. Uh, we basically have like someone's always there to talk to. And so that's from our culture, that's what it is, is like we want to be very respectful of people. We want to hire like best in class talent. We pay a very high salary, all things considered. Um, haven't outsourced anything, haven't contracted out or remoted anything, but we just hire whoever's the best in, they might be in Israel, they might, our head of DevOps is in Latvia. It just happened to be an amazing PhD who had an energy background and had worked at a company before. So from our standpoint, we have all these same people who are all pulling in the same direction, uh, which has worked out really, really successfully because a remote team is hard. Um, and so just having that and then, I mean, we communicate a ton on Slack. We're kind of outgrowing Slack right now and then have kind of check-ins on uh, what you accomplished yesterday and what you could and what you're planning on doing today and if there's any blockers. So those are just some things that we put together on a culture standpoint that have been great, but it's uh, really, I mean, it's a really, really fun team, and we've had extremely low employee turnover, um, empl low employee and uh, customer turnover, which obviously uh, those are pretty two key metrics when it comes to culture. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think culture for us from the start, I remember our, we were a, a team of around six or seven at the time, and we spent a day hiking out in the Redwoods in California. We've always been kind of a... a somewhat in person, somewhat remote, somewhat like a hybrid uh, work environment. My co-founder actually lives in California, in Texas, and so that that blend just naturally started pre-COVID. When COVID hit, we let our office space go, we went fully remote, and, and interestingly, it, it helped our culture tremendously because it, it became less about the California team and the Houston team, and it opened it up everywhere and kind of was a great equalizer for, for our company and allowed us, like you said, to bring in really great talent from from everywhere, uh, but our, our values, we have one, one of my favorite values of our company is that everyone takes out the trash. And at the beginning, that meant literally we did not have anyone to clean our office, everybody had to take out the trash. Uh, but it's, it has continued to have great meaning for us in that there is nothing that is too small for any of us or beneath any of us. And that means that sometimes I am you know, editing copy on the website or, you know, we're putting formulas in an Excel spreadsheet or whatever it might be, uh, or literally physically going to do something. We're hauling boxes, we're packing things up after an event. Like everybody jumps in and yep. dives in. And I think that culture has, has been so powerful for us in terms of everybody hits hard times, everybody has failures, everybody experiences things in their personal lives, whether it's kids or you know aging parents or whatever it might be, pets, anything. Uh, but the ability for everybody to pitch in, I think, has just been a real... Um, a great culture builder for us in terms yeah. of, you know, everybody, everybody dives in. Everybody's not afraid. And it, and it makes us really transparent and, and very direct also, like very candid with each other. So I think those, those values are always really interesting. For sure. And How many times a year do you all get together completely? We, you know, what we learned was we, get, we have kind of free reign for everybody to decide when they want to travel and when they need to be with people. And so there are no sort of hard and fast rules around it. We do have our... our Leadership team gets together four times a year. We're in person, and we do like a deep dive strategic planning session. Um, and then we have clusters across the team that are constantly getting together. And then we do a ton of small business events all across the country. So that's a great way that we're in front of our business owners, but we pull team members together. We make sure that everybody has time yeah. with the team because I do think that in person is, is critical. Yeah, it gets there. So we are, uh, I feel like I'm basically hosting a wedding uh, but I booked 90 hotel rooms in Puerto Vallarta for the end of April, and the entire team is <laughs> flying from all over the entire world at an all-inclusive resort. Uh, and so pretty funny, but I looked at the cost. Last year we did Houston, and we had a blast. So at that time, we were 38 attended last year. This year will be 90 plus or minus. 
uh, and we were at the um, at the post. Unbelievable office space, the old post office. Yeah. So we were there, and the best thing we had is we had a leadership uh, a, a guy leader a leadership coach who does this professionally, ex military. So what he set up for us is he brought in a scavenger hunt all over the city of Houston, and I mean I was born in Sharpstown. We got out of there pretty quick. Uh, grew up in Sugarland, and like I've spent, I mean all but like most of my years in Houston, and that is definitely home. Uh, but I did not know where a ton of this stuff was downtown. And so you had to go around and figure out like where a mural was or where this was. And so we were all just sprinting around, had like, had to, you had a team with the map, uh, had a team with the map inside the post, and then you had half the team out running around. And so I'm pretty tall and like, like to run. And the guy was probably like 10 inches shorter than me and he also liked to run, but I'm also super, super competitive. And so we wound up running and sprinting around, and it was not cool outside in like jeans and an <laughs> older version of these sneakers, and it was an absolute blast. But in terms of team building, you have those type of things that you just can't like, you can't change that. I mean, the let, going and playing with the data scientist paintball, like that's great culture. You get to shoot the CEO all day if you're mad at him. So it didn't get that <laughs> raise. So. I think particularly when you're not together all the time, it's even more critical. And it's interesting because the energy when we do get the team together 100%. is so powerful. Like we do, we have these small business scavenger hunts because we're very big on small business, obviously. Uh, and so we'll pick a city and go around and very similarly, like everyone has their, and even when we do it remotely, or we'll send gift cards to the whole team and everybody has to go out and, you know, buy an ice cream and you know, pop in a bookstore and all these different things just to get to know the yeah. small businesses and their community. So it's always... I think it's really fun to kind of build those things that are culture building for your own, for your own company in your own way. And it's so different for every company. It is definitely. So let's talk about the innovation side of the equation. Yeah. Obviously, we're both tech companies, but I think it's interesting and it's such a completely different world. So I'm curious to hear how, how you foster innovation. I mean, the companies, I think both of our companies were really built on innovation. It's why we formed in the first place. But how have you... How have you maintained that? And I think it's interesting to, to think about how that grows and evolves as the company grows. I think that scrappiness and that like hustle that, that you have when it's five or six employees, how that evolves when, when you're at 100 companies. I think we've both been there. Like, what, is, what does that path look like in terms of innovation? Yeah, I mean, I think innovation is just having a very like, diverse group around the table and then listening to all of their different feedback on things. We've got people who have worked predominantly at startups. We have people that have worked at the biggest of the big. We've got some ex-Meta and Amazon who have some really good takeaways and some really poor takeaways from their time there. And so it's just, it's interesting if you basically, one of the things I always say is I onboard every employee. And so within the first two weeks, I take 30 minutes to sit down with them and a couple of reasons. First thing I do, I, I just want to ask questions, have them ask questions and answer whatever they want to talk about. And so uh, we've gotten into a whole variety of conversations. Um, and But that kind of helps set the, again, from a culture standpoint, the open door policy. Because the thing that I always say is having worked at, having 90 employees, I have by one degree of separation worked at more than 500 companies, right? And so if you can go take what you see at all those different companies, then take the best of those. I tell everyone I have like, Ale, one of my engineers who's down in uh, Argentina, he comes in and he's like, man, you're doing this, this, and this right. I was at a company that sold for $100 million. You're crushing all of these things. Other people will say, hey, uh, we did what we're discussing doing here, and like, it didn't really go well at first, and here's why. And so getting all that feedback. And so I think from an innovation standpoint, that helps a ton. And then on the tech stack, bringing in best and brightest on the tech side, that is what has helped us. I mean, my co-founder uh, sold a hacker company to Intel coming out of college, um, was pre-IPO at Etsy, early at Planet, um, like spun up a data science team at McKinsey when he was 25, and Forbes 30 under 30 uh, in energy for what we we're doing here. And so just bringing in that best and brightest. And so you think you do a good job, you listen to customers, you try to create the best product, and then sometimes hopefully you get recognized for it. And that's what this year has turned into for us. Um, we just got named uh, Times 250 uh, Green Tech Company, 
And then we also got named uh, on the top 50 in AI on the A16Z Andreessen Horowitz American Dynamism. Uh, we're the only Houston company on there. Uh, there are only five energy companies on there. And so when you think you're doing innovation and you hear something like that, that just takes it to the whole next level. Um, and then another thing too is just bringing in the right people. We've hired a handful of Microsoft people recently, including my chief revenue officer, Alex Robart, um, who has a company in Houston. And he uh, set up a partnership. And so this last Tuesday, we announced uh, that we're have a partnership with Microsoft, they're selling us to utilities. So once you do all these things with innovation and get the word out there and let everyone know, then at some point it all comes back to be fully baked uh, and you kind of look at it from, I mean, you get to sit here and say, hey, we've worked really hard for six years and it's good to get that recognition. But innovation, you can't do things in the status quo and asking a ton of questions uh, makes it never go status quo. So let's, let's talk like in the weeds detail because I think it's really great to talk. Yeah. Innovation, yep. actually what that means. I think it's interesting. One, I feel like there, there's innovation just to the pure business model, right? How are you going into market? How is it different? How are you disrupting what the status quo is? And I look back, like when we started, as an example, we went out before, this was pre, I think, you know, the whole DEI space has evolved a lot over, over the last years. But when we started, it was a, an afterthought for, for everybody. Um, and everybody told us we should be a nonprofit. Sounds like a great nonprofit business you should go start. They'd like <laughs> pat us on the head and send us out the door. And, and we knew there was an opportunity there. Like I was absolutely convinced there was a massive financial opportunity. 99% of businesses are small. Nobody was tackling the small business space. Nobody was using technology certainly to support it. And, and I knew that if we could do this at scale, there was you know on average those 99% of businesses, even in their first two years of growth, are making two to seven thousand dollars of outsourced transactions a month. It's a lot of volume of transactions when you think that yeah. there's 33.5 million small businesses in the U.S. that nobody's nobody's thinking about. Uh, and so we we kept going, we kept going. I think so from a pure business model standpoint, we were very convinced there is a real profitable business here. It took us years to get there. We had a lot of hurdles to get over. But we did it. Now everybody's like, oh, we're so great. We could, you know, <laughs> so it's such a great it was really idea easy. that we could support from the beginning. It was <laughs> wonderful. You were just in the right place at the right time. I'm like, we were there before anybody was there. Like, what, we weren't in the right place at the right time for yeah. many years. When you think about your business model and how you came up with, with the innovation, how you, how you thought that this is, this is a viable business model that we need to go out and build, yeah. what did that process look like for you? Yeah, the, I mean, Great question. Uh, the process for us was people who know about energy live in Houston. People who knew about tech lived in San Francisco and New York. They've never met. They start meeting recently at events like this, but for the whole, they hadn't met. I knew that with everything that was happening on the grid, I started scheduling wind in 2005. Uh, I've been watching the energy transition since then, worked on a trade floor in high school. Um, I knew we were in a lot of trouble. I knew that rooftop solar was great, but it was going to cause a lot of problems. I knew that EVs are fun. I got one last year, and it's unbelievable, but I knew that my house was never going to look the same from the profile that it sat in. And so when we were going out and raising money, um, we told this big, grandiose uh, idea, which is now the customer bases that we serve. Back to your point, we had a very small, like our first valuation was $3 million pre-money. And it was two guys who had just met and had two retailers as a proof of concept that were old friends, one I went to high school with, and one uh, I was like interviewed in 2006 or seven. And so, yeah, we went in and said, this is what we're gonna do. But on the, the thing we always looked at is we want to be a tech company that does energy. There's a lot of energy companies that try to do tech and it doesn't work. I have donated a lot of bonuses to them uh, in my trading career of them saying, hey, this failed IT project costs $20 million. We're sorry that we can't pay you what we, you deserve this year, but our bad. So on the innovation side, that's what it was. We knew what was coming. I knew this market, and I knew that all of the energy transition that was coming was going to put us in a really bad place, and we needed these people who I was living in New York at the time were working at Google and Facebook and like these crazy data scientists, and I knew that these people had to meet or we were going to be in a lot of trouble. It's interesting when you talk about, I think that the, because I've had a business that has failed, and so I always try to look back of like, what is the difference of 
the company that failed versus the company that succeeded? Because the reality is I heard no's with both and how to differentiate between those two. Because a lot of people ask me, like, how do I know if my business is, is a viable opportunity or not? And I think the difference is with, with the ones that are viable, there are enough yeses, there's enough support, and, and does the customer actually see the value at the end of the day, right? The reality is investors don't necessarily have to see the value. They may not for a long time. Partners may not see the value for a long time. The press may not see the value for a long time. But if the customers see the value, that's the yeah. really critical piece. And so I think focusing on, on what they need, how are you innovating for them? And it's very difficult, right? Because you, you get this investor base that's behind you. They have an idea of where you need to go. You know, you do make these grand plans and then you learn and then you have to shift the strategy sometimes. And it's really hard to let go of, of what you thought and what you, what you promised and how do you actually shift and do what's best for the company. And so I think yeah. we've always been really transparent with our investors as things have changed. Look, we know we said this, we know we set out, we, this is what, we're, what we plan to do. Here's what we've learned. Here's why we think we need to change that. And, and continuing to innovate always for the customer at the end of the day. How, how do you all navigate what, what the plan was and what the reality is and how you bridge yeah. that, both internally, because I think there's certainly the side to investors, but also to your team. 100%. And I mean, from our standpoint, you want to ask for customer feedback, but also every customer <laughs> where a software company will happily turn you into a consulting company in under five seconds. And consulting companies are great, but they need to be consulting companies. Software companies that start consulting, it's doesn't normally end well. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think from us, uh, just being like very, very focused on that, uh, of, like we would scan, so we'd, we're launching Europe right now. And so there's, we're building out 21 countries and we built a very repeatable process. It's gonna take us six months to fully stand up 21 countries. PJM, which is like the Mid-Atlantic region, took a year and a half to stand up just part of the US. And now we can stand this up this quick. We went across, asked 30 potential clients or existing clients what countries were interesting. They all had different numbers. We then went and ranked and filed them and was like, okay, Germany's number one, UK is number two, and then went through and looked at it that way. And so just taking the customer feedback, but then processing it and then going down and then making the decision is helpful. And if you do that, your investors are gonna be very understanding. We pitched a totally crazy concept of our seed round and we are doing none of it, and we will probably do none of it, but it was, it looked like the right thing, and then we raised our seed round, we raised two million bucks, and to go build a marketplace, which costs, like, add some zeros to that, uh, to the two million, and then COVID happened. And I was like, okay, now is not the time to innovate. Now is the time to, like, block and tackle. Then after COVID, what happened for those of us who live in Texas? Winter storm, Uri. And so when you deal with, I mean, when you deal with people that are serving electricity demand, oh, yeah, they're not ready to innovate then. They're just trying to keep the lights on. Um, and so I think you've just, you've got to look at what the market gives you uh, and to an extent on top of what the customer says. But if, again, going back to the open and transparent thing, if you have a good working dialogue with your investors, they're totally down. I always say there is nothing surprising should be at a board meeting. Everything should be done and orchestrated. It should just be literally a three-hour bookkeeping session of here's what this looks like, et cetera. We've already had all the hard conversations ahead. So, yeah, I think just keeping that transparency the whole time and internally, um, we did a we just had a ton of new people come on and we did what we called a full like state of the union. And I got up there with the exec team well, virtually and we gave them everything. We gave them our metrics down to the thousand dollars and how the expenses looked and all that. And I had like 25 people who had just started being like, we have literally never worked at a company that we knew anything about any of the stuff you just told us. We talked about our OKRs. We have six of them for like six of them for the year. We talked about our mission, our vision, our values, and just like set that standpoint. And every one of them was like, we've never like, the 25 people who pinged me were like, we've never seen this before. And so we recorded it. Now it's just included in the onboarding packet. So I think those are some of the ways, again, just to kind of get ahead of this. Yeah, it's inter I, think, I do think the transparency with the team goes so far. And it's, I think about our, our early years, the reality was it, was it was difficult because we had a really lean team. And so trying to track all these metrics requires capacity. And it felt like by the time we could get the metrics, we were on to the next thing. And, and so we, I would say we had probably less Transparency in our earliest years, we've evolved where we are real-time transparent with 
everything, including our finances, where we stand. Uh, and I, I think particularly, I mean, there have been periods in our company where it was a little scary to be that transparent <laughs> with our team. 100%. And, and we were very forthcoming of like, look, here's, here's where we are. We may have to make layoffs. We may have to make some really hard decisions. We understand, and, and with certain, you know, particularly with certain employees that you really want to maintain, having those conversations and saying, look, I get if you want to leave. You have a lot of opportunities here. There's a lot of things that you could be doing. What's been interesting is that 100% of the time we've had those people stay with us and stick with us. And I think a huge part of it is because we've been, we've been really honest. And we've always told people, as soon as we know something, as soon as we have information, we're going to give it to you. Yep. And we're going to try not to blindside anybody here. Um, and, and I think that, that says a lot about the type of company that you lead and, and what you're building. Absolutely. How many years were you all lean until you just took off from a headcount standpoint? In terms of the, the size of staff? I mean, we're always lean. I would say we operate just oh, we, yeah. very lean. Like it, it, we were always in that scrappy startup mode. And I think we've always built a culture of, you know, be thoughtful with spend. We are... Chief financial officer is one of those people that goes down to, it can be you know a $10 a month subscription. He's like, do we need this? Is this necessary or yeah. not? It doesn't look like anybody's using it and we eliminate it. Uh, and the team is really good about that. Flagging things, I don't think we need this anymore. Is oh, anybody yeah. using this? Uh, so that I would say culturally is just embedded into our, yeah. our company. Yeah, we had for us in on January 1st of, so we started in January of 18. In January of 2022, we had 12 employees. And then January of 2023, we had 28 employees. And then now we're at, I think, 90. So it's a big jump. It's been a big. We went through a jump like that. That's a, yeah, that's a, that's a big, that's a game It's pretty wild. I feel like when surpassing that kind of 25 number, it changes. Yeah. When, when you're not directly connected to every employee at your company, it, it shifts the dynamic quite oh, a bit. Oh, yeah. You're like, this, I'm signing this offer for who? <laughs> and they do what? And they live where? Okay, good talk. Yeah, yeah. It's very... Definitely changes changes the game. I think I'm, I'm quite a control freak in terms of I like to I like to know all the information about everything to make a decision, which makes it really hard when you have a company that's bigger and you have to let people make decisions and trust. I think what I've learned in that process is having the very best executive team, or you can disperse that leadership, but you fully trust. And it makes me realize where I have a great degree of trust and where I don't. And I've I've quickly over the years I think where I used to sort of let things go for a little longer. And now I'm like, if I don't have that degree of trust, it's not the right person and I need to make a change. And yeah. I need to make a change quickly. And I'm, because it makes all the difference in the world, I think. It I agree. My first like big exec hire after we raised our A, I messed up. Uh, and part of it is I didn't clearly define what success looked like for him. Um, and so that was not good to like fully let him know what the North Star looked like. And then I didn't, like I assumed that he would know what was going on for those first like three to six months just because he knew the space extremely well. He had sat in the seat of what would have been a potential customer and it just didn't. And so I called a friend of mine, uh, his name is Kieran, he's CEO of a really cool company called Arcadia. And I was like, man, what do you do? Like, how do you, how do you onboard these? I know you've had some big hits and some big misses. And he goes, man, for the first three months, that's your best friend. Like spend as much time with them as possible everything, have them on every call, meet up as, like, because it's fully remote, meet up with them as many places as possible, do that for three months, and then let them fly or let them go. And if you do that, every single one's flown since then. Because again, that first three months was just a full brain dump of like, this is what we do. And then after that, I don't have to worry about it. And then I have that trust that they're going to like go in and make the right decision. Because you can't like, you can't micromanage like as many execs as you have and as big a team as you can. And so then you get to kind of have that kind of waterfall effect, which is extremely helpful. Okay, I'm going to put you on the spot in a second, but I'm going to give you a second to think about it. I want to talk about failures and, and where we've screwed up as CEOs. Uh, but I'm going to give you a second because I'm going to share mine first. So you have a minute right, to think right. about it. Um, so I think it's, it's really important of, of the learnings over the years. And I look, I mean, there are a million screw ups and failure is one of my favorite topics to talk about because I think it's, it's where the biggest learnings and, and leaps come from. Um, but if I look back, I think in that, I would say it was in that, that jump from the, because we did a similar leap at our company from that like 25 to 100 jump. And we've, we've come back since then a little bit. Um, and so I'll, I'll share some learnings <laughs> on, on, on that journey. But the biggest thing for me was 
when we, when we scaled up, we had closed our Series B, we had funding, things were booming. We were one of those companies that actually did quite well during COVID uh, and grew tremendously fast, much faster than we anticipated. And it really threw, I would say, our entire strategy just shifted overnight for the better, but there were a lot of pain points along the way. And we brought in, we built up the team really, really quickly and brought in experts that were very much came from the corporate world um, and, and put a lot of trust into that team. And we went through this phase with a company where it was like everybody needed more, everybody needed more, everybody needed more capacity, everybody needed more people, everybody needed everything. And we just said yes because things were growing so quickly. And very quickly what happened is that, is that there, were, there were, one, way too many cooks in the kitchen, I think, for projects. We had, we had set these things out. Things were changing rapidly in fairness, so it became really difficult for the team. But everybody had an opinion. There were a lot of conflicting opinions. And I was like, culturally, if I think about the low point at our company as a team, it was during that stage where amazing people, the employees were phenomenal, the talent was great. It, it wasn't the... It was too many, too many different visions happening at one time. And, and we stripped back and we said, look, we're gonna, we're gonna completely cut out this layer of, of this like middle range of, of management and, and ripped it out completely and, and did it kind of an overnight shift. And it was amazing in the span of 30 days how much our team culture shifted back. We got back to that scrappiness. We got back to the doers. And ever since then, the big rule that we've had is that no matter what level of the company you sit at, one, you have to operate very cross-functionally, always. It's critical at our company. And so if you're not always operating with other team members uh, and building these clusters that are very cross-functional, it's not gonna work. Two, everybody has to stay in the weeds. And so there's some job that they have to do that is at the very kind of the deepest trenches of the company where you can't just be a manager, you can't just be a strategist, you have to be an operator. And that ability for everybody to be an operator I think changed quite significantly. But I will say it was a period where I look back at how much we spent in that learning lesson. It was a very expensive period of time <laughs> for our company, uh, but a great learning lesson. And I think I've, I, in hindsight, I'm, I'm glad we went through it, but certainly don't want to go through it again. Yeah, that's, I mean, going through and the people who came in kind of higher level and didn't get in the weeds, like those are the people who just doesn't like, again, the doer mentality and like at a startup, like this is not a big giant corporation where you have to have like all those different layers. So um, yeah, it was a really good question. And so thinking through those, we've had like some product misses and things like that. But for us, I would say uh, it's, it was definitely, not knowing what not knowing what it took to get from like a pre-seed to a seed round for us. Um, and so not knowing like what those metrics are, there's a few like little things I could have changed. We had a very rough uh, seed round. It makes you much more impressive, like much feel much more like accomplished when you have a really good series B. Um, but for our seed round, I just didn't know exactly what it took to get to that level. We were like, we were in Texas and we worked in Aust and we had a client in Australia and we were promised we can build the East Coast, but the East Coast is totally different. And then I'm very like forward, like when I traded, I always traded, it's called a cash trader, which is basically like next week in, you're really looking at like the 15 days that you have like an actual weather model. And so you, it doesn't inspire you to look like way out years and years. As a CEO, you need to look out years and years, but not lose focus on the 15 days. And so from my standpoint, we said so much what's in front of us. And again, just being like honest and transparent, we went out and raised a seed round with a not a big vision pitch, made a couple just fatal errors of like me and my co-founder pitch. So one person can tell a story and if they're a good storyteller, then the story works. Two people can almost never like tell a story together. Uh, like even no matter how closely they're connected or if that's who you talk to every single day. And so just a few errors that I had like that, that's why I spend a bunch of time with uh, early stage startups, just like helping them and like coaching them around fundraising. Cause like that would have made a massive difference in dilution, how much runway we had, how quickly would it could have built. And again, I'm thankful for it. We had some great partners come out of it um, and we're, we're here today and everything's going great. But nonetheless, like that was a really, really hard time um, because I didn't know what 
like what the next step was. And so now being like having our series be in October, I already know what a series C exactly looks like, what metrics I have to do, what I have to do, how I need to direct the team, product expansion, all of the above. And like now it's like, okay, we got this. But again, those early stage, you just don't know unless you talk to somebody who's done this before. There's not, I mean, there's books, there's lots of books, but you need to actually talk to somebody who's done it before. I, what, what, speaking of books, one of my favorite books is The Messy Middle. I think it's a great, it, it goes like piece by piece of a company of basically everything that go wrong and how to sort of unravel all those, all those pieces. I always feel like no matter where our company, as it's grown, even in the early stages and the later stages, it feels like you're always in the messy middle. Yeah. It's a really, a really good read. Um, so Houston, raise your hand if you're in Houston currently. Wow, I would have thought we'd have more Houstonians here. You're great. Um, Okay, I want to talk about building a company in Houston specifically. You mentioned you started off in New York, yeah. came to Houston. We started actually heavily in California, shifted a lot of resources over to Houston. So I'm curious what what brought the move to Houston? Yeah, it's, I mean. I mean, you're in energy. I'm guessing that had something to do with it. Energy was a ton. Energy and like starting to raise a family. But when I left in 2013, like the Houston I left in 2013, probably would have not come back to. Um, but just that jump, I came back in 2019, was just a massive jump. Um, and so, I mean, you got to see things of like Greater Houston Partnership. And so I started looking at that. One of my first, like the, one of the first people that ever gave me the time of day, I was a I think senior in uh, college, was uh, Bob Harvey, who ran Greater Houston Partnership, I guess for the last 10 or so years. Uh, and so like with that, he really made a push for this. You started seeing a whole bunch of like Greentown Labs coming, the ION coming, uh, just a variety of member of these like startups. And so it's gotten talent actually here and cost of living is still not that bad in the scheme of things. So the talent pool is a ton better than it has been in Houston. And then for us being in energy, I mean, <laughs> a third of the clients are just right down the road. And so you can literally just stop by the office, you can throw a happy hour, you can do whatever, and you can see everyone simultaneously. Everyone, also now, Houston fully understands, you have some people who think the energy transition means completely get rid of all oil and all gas as quickly as possible. And then and just build as many wind farms as possible and stick solar on every single roof. And that's not gonna end well. Um, but then you also have these big companies. You look at a Shell, a BP, who have completely changed everything and are completely like leading that move. And then you have some people, I mean, Nextera is a great example of they were Fordle Power and Light and they rebranded however long ago and are now one of the leaders in this entire space. NG, French utility, one of the leaders in this entire space. And so that's where we're seeing all of this come together. And so Houston actually understands the energy transition in my a personal opinion because we need to do a whole lot of different things but we need to do them on the right time frame or it's not going to end well and i think houston's the best place to look at that the tech talent is getting better the energy talent is getting more thinking outside the box i'm in electricity because i literally got out of college i went and talked to an oil trader a natural gas trader an electricity trader the electricity trader was 26 and doing really well I was 22, 26 is closer to 22 than 50 is. And so it was like, we're gonna go with the 26 year old who's crushing. And that's how I ended up in electricity back in 2005. So, and now it's the popular thing. We've been cool for, I think, coming up on two years now. So. <laughs> All in due time, right? All in due time. It's interesting, I mean, I think when, when we started, it was like you had to hire your tech talent in, in San Francisco. It didn't seem like there was any no. other option. Maybe New York, maybe Boston, but very few markets where you could find tech talent. And I look now where some of our strongest engineering talent is, one, we have a good dose in Latin America, uh, in Colombia, we have, but, but North Carolina, we have a great engineer in Wisconsin. I mean, it's just random places. Houston, we have great talent in Houston. It, it really is quite dispersed, uh, which I think is really interesting. I think COVID also probably, you know, the pandemic just spread a lot of that talent oh, yeah. all over. Um, but it's been interesting. I kind of feel like it was like the great equalizer that the tech talent has has really broadened. Um, but Houston, at the end of the day, I do feel like the the culture that sits at the core of our company is very Texas. We were, yep. like I said, 50-50 California, Texas. And if you can pick more opposite states, we did. <laughs> we, we 
overwhelmingly as a company, and my co-founder would agree, she's like, we've got to go the Houston path. Like, Houston is where it's at. And we, we really started to funnel a lot more resources. Um, yeah. a lot, I mean, a lot of it, too. Houston is here with, like, arms open and, like, welcoming people in and actively recruiting. And there's, I lived in Illinois. I lived in New York. Both of them have their pros and cons. Um, but they're not trying to be business-friendly states right now. Um, and Texas is literally like, let's go, everybody, like, come show up here. And so I think that's just a really huge driver. Um, I mean, from everything, from, I mean, from how much you pay in taxes to, like, all of the above. So, I mean, it's been really good. We moved our headquarters down here fully, I guess, in 21. Um, but I would say definitely at our core, we're very, like, Texan, uh, even though we only have, I think, 14 out of 90 there. Because, yeah, you're seeing all these, like, little hubs all over the place. We've got a great customer success guy in Nebraska. And then, like, we have a little few people They're so in nice in, in Nebraska. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, we can, the nicest people Ours are in Nebraska. Ours is in Minnesota. It's our head of customer Solid. <laughs> Solid. Yeah. Interesting. So we've got Louisville for heavy CS, too. Uh -huh. I'm like, okay, all the, all the like, right in the bread basket. That's awesome. So. Um, I want to open it up for questions. Maybe if you all have questions, just come up to the microphone uh, and, and jump in while we're waiting for anybody to, to pop in with questions. What, Sean, how would you define your role, if you were to define your biggest responsibility as a CEO, what, when you wake up in the morning or you think about the next quarter or the next year or whatever it may be, where do you center your, your time and energy? Oh, goodness gracious. Um, I mean, I realize just kind of going back to the talent end of the culture, I mean, even the innovation is you've got to inspire, you've got to lead. And I mean, again, the, the take out the trash, you need to show that you're willing to do everything. You're willing to go set up at conferences. You're willing to go run down these lists. You're willing to give feedback on every set of, but at the end of the day, you need to be out there just leading and inspiring and showing people like we're going this way. And so I think for me, that's what I look at and like in everything I do and every like action is just realizing, realizing that I have a ton of people looking at me. And so going out there and just saying like, hey, this is what we're doing. I got on my group morning call uh, like, and jumped on Teams like video with the South by Southwest in the background. And I'm like, this is what I'm doing today. And it's awesome because we're talking at a pure, not an energy panel. It is a pure like tech startup panel. So yeah, I think for, for myself, that's what, that's what I realize now. And I'm, I've got an executive coach now. My board is on me at all times of just like, what is the best use of your time? Uh, and it's hard. It's hard to prioritize your time. I'm still, I spend a ton of time, <laughs> read all my coach's notes on the Vaughn Lane from Houston this morning. And I was like, oh, okay, I didn't do that one. Sorry, Maggie. Uh, it's, a, but yeah. it's a journey. It's what a about journey. yourself? I would say being decisive. I learned, and it wasn't something that I think came supernaturally to me. I like to always hear both sides, get a lot of information. I'm not always necessarily the fastest decision maker. And over the years, I've learned Quick decisions are the most important thing I can do for the business, uh, and, and because it provides clarity and it allows everybody to move forward. I didn't. I never realized how much my opinion mattered to the team. I think I always tried to build a really kind of egalitarian culture, and, and that yeah. where everybody had a say, but that the team really craved. And it was interesting. In, in my feedback, I would always hear, "We we just we we want the like we want that that they really wanted it." And it was hard for me to understand that because. Yep. When I was managed, when I had managers, I didn't want them, which is maybe why I'm a CEO. I didn't want anybody to tell me what to do. <laughs> I had my own, my own opinions. Uh, and our team does. I mean, they have a lot of freedom. I realize no matter how much direction I give, there's a lot of freedom within that in terms of how they operate and execute yeah. uh, and implement. So I've, I've learned to be much more decisive over the years. I like that. Other questions? Yeah. Hi. Um, this first one is for Sean and then for both of you. Uh, you you've been hiring highly, um, from what you've described, highly technical folks. How are you ferreting culture through the process? It's a little bit tactical. And secondly, more tactical too, as you're growing and you have a limited budget like in a startup, are you using recruiters? Do you see that as a, a viable, because that can eat up some of your budget? <laughs> I hate recruiters. Um, <laughs> sorry if there's any recruiters out there. Uh, no, from a, from a technical talent, yeah, I think by onboarding them in the first two weeks, that's something that they just don't really see and asking them, like, what makes them tick, why they're here, why they thought Ampron was interesting, how did they find us? Um, and so, uh, so, I mean, I think from that standpoint, my VP of engineering um, is super impressive. Uh, her name's Kalpana, and she's done this a handful of times. And 
honestly, like having a woman at the top of VP of engineering helps from a cultural standpoint a lot. Engineering can have a tough culture sometimes. Uh, and so she was, A, we ran a massive process with a really expensive recruiter because I was uncomfortable hiring a VP of engineering. As I joke, I'm the tech CEO that can kind of work a laptop. Uh, and so ran through that whole process and she just absolutely crushed it. But we also knew that on the people side that she was gonna be above and beyond. She's done this four times, she's been VP of Eng. Uh, and so she's really done a great job of setting that culture. The engineering culture since she started last July is like 10x better. Um, because again, it's a hard culture. People are siloed. They often wanna be siloed, but until they don't. Um, and so that's something that's been really hard. Recruiting is, a, it's hard. Uh, so last year when we started growing, I dropped about half a million bucks on recruiters. Um, and so I would say, if you're gonna use them, because there are times that you have to use them, there's a couple hacks, is make sure, try to get, you can't actually always figure out if somebody's worthwhile in 90 days. And so when I hired the VP of Eng, it was an expensive recruiting, but they had a one year guarantee on this position, which made me feel a ton better. You will 1000% know if somebody's good within a year. Um, so I thought that was interesting. You can, I definitely and still would like cry poor as often as possible and say, hey, I'm look, I can only do this. Well, it's only 30%, yeah, I can't do that. I would just prefer to tell everyone the job is 30% higher in salary and then I have a happy employer as opposed to a happy recruiter. Um, and so they'll often like let you beat them down to about 20%. Um, and so that was helpful. Uh, they're necessary evil until you hit scale, but we went and hired a really good New York technical recruiter and he has probably saved me a million bucks since he started in September uh, in what I would have paid in fees. Because again, on the commercial side, I'm very social. I'm older than my co-founder. I've been doing the energy space for 19 years now. And so like, it's very easy to do one degree of separation from me. And we've got a talented commercial team who commercial people, like especially sales, have to be outgoing and social. So they're like, oh my gosh, I worked with this great person. Awesome, we'll bring them in. On the engineering side, it's a lot less so than that unless they're in management. So the other way you can do this is find someone, like I asked this on all of my, like all my manager ones, is I was like, how do you inspire people? Who would you bring over here, assuming that I'm not gonna get sued, uh, that who would you bring over here day one? Who have you worked with before that you like working with? Who would follow you to the next company? And if they can't have a good answer for that, then they're probably not like a good manager previously. They might still work out but they weren't previously a good manager who can, again, bring their network over. So those are a couple of my like recruiting hacks, but we have paid zero dollars in recruiting fees in the past nine months, and I'm very, very happy about that. Torrance is awesome, he's crushing it on the recruiting front, as we've hired about over 30 people in that time, in that time frame. I'll, I'll echo, we went the recruiting, you know, executive search firm route for some higher level positions. I think probably the, the like biggest mistake that we made in terms of just not being a cultural fit at all. On day one, I called my co-founder and I was like, it was for a CFO hire we made. And I was like, I don't think this is gonna work out. I'd met him in New York and in, literally in 24 hours, I was like, I'm very concerned. We made a bad decision here. And it was, uh, but it was, it was the most expensive hire we made. Luckily we got everything back and it was fine. But what we found was that it, employee referrals are the best and strongest recruiting path for us. 100%. Um, and, then, and then partner referrals. We work a ton with a lot of people across the ecosystem, and so we're always asking just who do you know across, across your network? Um, we've always gotten great referrals. So we have one internal recruiter. She's amazing. Uh, it helps she has a British accent so she can say things like really, really hard conversations with a British accent and everybody loves her just the same. So <laughs> she's, she's a great awesome. recruiter. Yeah, that is one I completely echo get an internal recruiting program done as quickly as possible. We went in and, I mean, we pay, I think, 5,000 uh, per, and everyone's ecstatic about that. But when we were like really hard up for engineers, we just doubled it. Because there's no recruiter getting anything for 10K, and they will literally, everybody, we might only took it to eight, but everybody will get out of bed for 8K. I'll still get out of bed for 8K for sure. I'm, unfortunately, the recruiting program does not apply to me or I'd be retired. So, um, but yeah, internal recruiting program is huge because they're not gonna risk their job on somebody that they don't think is gonna perform. Mm -hmm. Do we have another question? 
Hello. Um, so as, as an executive in a tech startup and someone who's kind of newly navigating the corporate structure since a buyout, um, I'm curious. I mean, listening to conversations like this are extremely helpful and insightful. So um, outside of South By, do you guys have any other leadership or executive-driven conferences that you try to frequent or attend to sharpen your own skill sets? I'm part of YPO, Young President's Organization. I find it to be a super helpful network in terms of just a lot of transparency across other other CEOs navigating growing companies. Um, it's been really helpful for me. It's also, I feel like I can be very open about things internally with my team. There's a great deal of confidence in that. There's organizations for women, particularly like Chief, that are really great, um, industry organizations. But I think finding a forum, and even I would say before YPO, like, like I always had a really informal network of four to five other CEOs that were in unrelated spaces that I could just ask questions to. And there was zero filter, because uh, I think it's so critical. There's so many things that you're dealing with that you can't, I can't even talk to my co-founder about sometimes because it's just, it's something that she may have an opinion that's really different and I, I just need a third party objective source and I'm super close to my co-founder, but you know, there's, there's topics that aren't necessarily that easy to talk about with your team. Um, and my spouse, he's an entrepreneur too, but there's only so many things that he wants to hear about with my company. So it's good to have that, that group. I think it's really important. Yeah, I think, I mean, in terms of this year, we're trying to get into more generalist things as opposed to just energy heavy. There's an, especially because we serve so many different, uh, like we serve utilities, we serve retailers, we serve traders, we serve mun municipalities and co-ops. We serve like power producers, we serve, there's a conference every five minutes. And so like, I wasn't even home for February, it felt like, uh, and now with, with Europe. So I have not done a good job of kind of broadening my horizon uh, in terms of this. However, going back to this, I have, I mean, I have a ton of CEOs that I just hang out with who are all in the same type of position. And one of the things, going back to the gentleman I mentioned earlier, Elliot, is he, he came in and he's like, okay, I wanna, he's like, I know you have a network and like, it's fine. And I was like, no, no, no you're gonna come with me to these things and, and there's a whole bunch of energy things I do like Clean Tech Leaders Roundtable, Dynamo, a uh, number of different things from that standpoint. Um, but surrounding yourself with people, if you wanna have a good product person, have them hang out with other product person people, especially that are in a slightly different space than you or their competitors. If you wanna be a good head of sales, sales is one thing, head of sales is a totally different thing. Hang out with other people who lead the crazy chaos that is sales orgs. So, I mean, that's where I look at it. It's like find people who have your same connection. And again, almost everybody will take a phone call because it's a lonely job. <laughs> and so they will literally go in and say like, hey, I'm happy to chat with you. I have been watching your company. I'm a big fan of your company. I lead product at XYZ. I'd love to have a, just a conversation about some of the stuff you're going through. We're going through a buyout right now. And I just you just went through this six months ago. Would you like... Can we grab coffee? I'm pretty sure if they, unless it's LinkedIn, because those don't always show up, uh, then like they'll have the conversation. All right, uh, we have just a couple of minutes left. Oh, okay, one quick question. We'll do one quick one. Thank you. Um, this great conversation, and I guess it goes back to you just made a point about your co-founder, and sometimes you can't talk to her about certain things. Now, you both have co-founders. You both started the companies, obviously, together with them. Can you talk about how you both became the CEOs and how that relationship with the co-founders has continued, you know, and, and continues to go? Yeah, Elizabeth and I, and I would say, are very interchangeable in terms of how we, how we run the company. I think that the one thing I'll say is that we have our our like core values for the business are 100% aligned um, and always have been. And so there have been times where, where she stepped in, there were times where I stepped in, we have, like, I'm, I'm CEO, she's president. It's like, I don't even know which one, does, who cares who's what. It's less about titles. I mean, I started the company before she was there. And so that was sort of, I had the role, I stuck with the role. Um, but I think in terms of how we've managed it, she's amazing on the sales side. I tend to, to drive kind of the, the team and the vision much more. It's just the way that we operate. She's great at just pushing things forward. We have our skill sets and, and know where our lane is. I don't know if there's a real formal structure to it necessarily, but there's a lot of clarity behind it. So I think it's so different for every company. I know some people manage much more on the operational side, others on the you know external side. It's it's a very different dynamic for everyone, but I've been really fortunate and the, the informality has worked really well for us. 
Yeah, our side was pretty clear cut. Um, just he's very technical. He was 26 when we started this whole thing. Doesn't overly like enjoy being around people. Just kind of wants to do his thing. An architect, um, but most talented engineer I've ever met. And so for him, being CTO made a ton of sense. However, he's helped out so much on the strategy and on product. And when you have to do all those things, I mean, I think that he probably, when we started, averaged over 100 hours a week. He'd be up at all hours, just like just going down the rabbit hole. So, but for in terms of being CEO, it was almost, I mean, it was my industry. I had had leadership roles before, but at the end of the day, I also think that you still have to grow into that role. And so I think that's where, from my standpoint, I spend so much time, whether it's reading, hanging out with other CEOs, talking to my board, who's other CEOs, and just kind of like trying to take myself to the next level. So it wasn't hard, but there are situations that like, if y'all had a co-founded the company together, it might've been a little bit of a, a little bit of a harder conversation. Ours was pretty cut and dry at the beginning. He's like, I don't really want to talk to people that much. I was like, well, I guess it's me then. Uh, so. <laughs> I'll take it. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much. Um, super. Thank you, Sean. This is really a great, pleasure. great conversation. Always fun to, to dive into these these pieces of the business because I think it's the the really hard and kind of abstract part. I'm but I think for like another two hours. Yeah, one of the most critical pieces. So thanks, and and you'll have a great South by. Mm -hmm.